You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hello, please let me see your ticket stubs for the double-edged double bill. This week, Adam Driver is the man who killed Don Quixote by ordering the Midnight Special. Each week, Adam Thomas and Thomas Mariani will come to the table to discuss the randomly selected yin and yang of a double feature. Then, both will have to pick a number between 1 and 10 or seal their fates for the next episode. One will have two good movies, the other two bad ones. Let the chaos begin. And I am Adam Thomas, and I want to let the midnight special shine down on me. And I am Thomas Mariani, the Lord of La Mancha, my destiny calls and I go. Holy shit, man, we're gonna get a record deal. Uh, Broadway, please, just open back up for us, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this, uh, thankfully not musically inclined show. Oh, uh, that's only the intros. From here, we're gonna be not singing, uh, as we uh, talk about, as we do every week, a good and a bad feature related to a topic. And uh, the topic we're doing um, was chosen by both our patrons, Edgelord patrons, patreon.com slash cedbpod, voted in a poll between two actors we wanted to vote an episode to. One was Al Pacino, the other one was Mr. Adam Driver, our subject, because uh, they're both in that House of Gucci movie, which um, we'll get into a bit later. When was I going to talk about it a bit? But Adam Driver, such a fascinating person. Adam, as a fellow Adam, I'm sure you're very impressed by this young man's career. Yeah, no relation. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really like Adam Driver. I, I'm a huge fan of his, especially after uh, you know, sort of his SNL appearances and things like that. Where you know he's just the type of actor and type of celebrity I like to see. Where he he allows himself to sort of just cut loose and have fun, but he can also do very serious, dramatic stuff. He keeps his life and his personal life very close to the chest, which I really like. Like he's in it for the art of it, not for really the celebrity. That's true. He's very interesting because um, he's acted like an interesting just life path in general. Like he started off, uh, he was a Marine when he was quite young and he then went to the stage and he's only been acting in film and television for 10 years. But Adam, here's what he's done in 10 years so far. Uh, he's played the villain in a Star Wars trilogy. He's been nominated for two Oscars for Marriage Story and Black Klansman. He was nominated for three Emmys, uh, three for Girls, the show he was on, but also one for SNL, as you mentioned he hosted. By the way, he's hosted that show three times as of yet and worked with the following directors, uh, Clint Eastwood, Steven Spielberg, the Coen brothers, Jim Jarmusch, uh, twice, Steven Soderbergh, Spike Lee, Martin Scorsese, and Ridley Scott twice this year. He's an up-and-comer. You gotta keep your eye on this kid. He's going places. <laughs> Might be. Who knows? He's got a couple of things in the works. <laughs> yeah, no, that's insane. That, that's almost an unheard of sort of career trajectory. I mean, within 10 years that he's worked with all of the top directors, been in very high-profile films, has been nominated, you know, twice over. Pretty insane. And I think what's so interesting also is the fact that how distinctive he looks. I think that's the big thing when he came on, when... Like, I seen him in, like, Inside Llewellyn Davis was the first time I probably saw him in anything. But the first time I noticed him, like, oh, my God, obviously, was Kylo Ren. I think him, the moment he popped up, when that helmet came off, and we were aware, like, oh, that's what he fucking looks like under there. It's such a tremendous visage, his whole face is. Like, any time you see him, just the way that he smiles with, like, the laugh lines and stuff. He already just, like, out the gate is just, like, such a fascinating presence to look at. And then he's also a really good actor who can really disappear into roles and really commit, even on... SNL, like, what's the one SNL skit where he plays the old guy at the fucking school? He's Pete Davidson's oil baron father. Yes, where he's an old, old <laughs> yeah, fashioned yes. oil baron who's like hundreds of years old. Funny yep. as shit. Such a funny fucking skit. And he's committed to it. And he's just, just like he's committed to any dramatic role. He's one of those guys where he really commits to the bit, as it were. Oh, yeah, 100%, dude. Like I said, that's why that's why I really, really like him. And, man, you hit it right on the head with sort of the uniqueness of his look. Nobody looks like him. Nobody even sounds like him. It's impossible to do an impression of him on SNL. They could, no one can do an impression of that dude. They recently tried, and oh, yeah. it was okay. Mm -hmm. But, uh, 
yeah, no, he's just, there's, there's nobody like him working today. And I mean, granted, I think that's why he does get maybe a little bit more, um, opportunities for auditions and stuff like that but clearly he has the chops to back it up too yes that's true we are here to talk about two specific films because at the end of every episode we choose uh, a good and a bad feature to talk about so between our choices adam had two good choices we end up with a movie called midnight special and then uh, i came up with uh the two bad picks and we got the man who killed don quixote so uh let's start off first with midnight special Police issued an Amber Alert for an eight-year-old boy. He was abducted from his home near El Dorado, Texas. It's time. You ready? Yeah. Okay. What do you know about Alton Meyer? I wouldn't know where to start. He would have fits. Things would break. It was like a feeling. What kind of feeling. <laughs> We need to know where he is. You all have no clue what you're dealing with, do you? The ranch thinks you're their safe. The Midnight Special came out on March 18th, 2016 from writer-director Jeff Nichols. Who made two movies actually in 2016? This and Loving, the one with Ruth Nega and Joel Edgerton. The uh, landmark uh, mixed racial marriage case. Exactly. Yes. Um, and uh, this is the first one he came up with, though, which is very different. It's a earnest kind of like quiet sci-fi film that basically follows a, a group of adults who were part of this cult that was led by Sam Shepard. Um, the main person escaping being uh, Roy, who years ago escaped and has now gotten his child. Um, who is Alton, played by Jaden Martell, out. And um, it turns out that young Alton has some sort of mysterious powers where he can sense things. And when he sees at certain points, gets exposure to the sun, like his eyes have this giant laser that kind of pops up. And people are like fascinated. And like I said, a whole cult has grown around this kid and his ability to tell things. And um, he's uh, out with his dad, Michael Shannon. Um, and also Joel Edgerton, who plays Lucas, and they meet up with a bunch of other people, but they are also being chased by the FBI and the NSA in the form of Adam Driver, uh, who is sort of a supporting player here, um, is looking out, trying to find out this kid and see maybe if he knows a bit too much about our satellites and stuff. But Adam, this was your choice, and you had not seen this film, correct, before we decided to watch it? That is correct. It was always on my radar, man. I'd heard good things about it, and just from seeing the trailers and everything, it looked like it was something that was right up my alley. Just for some reason, it's like I tried to start it a couple times, and it is a really slow burn. And every time I tried to start it, it was like either late at night or something, so I just never got the opportunity to like really get into it. So that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to put it up for one of the options for this, so I you know, have a reason to really sit down and watch it. You know, the thing is, it's like if someone were to ask me, hey, man, do you want to watch a real slow burn sci-fi movie? Yeah, of course. You want to watch one with like your three favorite character actors working today? Yeah. Yeah, this movie's right up my fucking alley. Like, this is totally an Adam movie. I was pretty much like on board for all of it. I have a lot of questions. Uh, I think that most people who see this movie do. But uh, the fact that they're not really answered doesn't bother me in this one. I, I really really thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed this movie uh yeah i'd seen this in the theater initially actually um i'd written about it and um i hadn't seen it since so in 2016 it's been about five years and it's interesting because i don't like it quite as much as i did i still quite like the movie quite a bit i would say it's probably my weakest of jeff nichols's movies because he also made like mud um and loving and a few others i would consider a bit better but at the same time what was so refreshing watching this in 2021 is just that this is clearly a movie inspired by a lot of, like, Amblin and Steven Spielberg movies, but it doesn't feel quite like a Stranger Things, where, like, they'll have a very obvious reference to one of those things. It, it feels like it's definitely, especially Close Encounters. I think you can agree. This feels a lot like Close Encounters in particular, where it's quiet, character-focused, oh. when, when the effect stuff happens, it's big and giant and awe-inspiring, but it still is, like, very low-key in a way that I found uh, really refreshing, because it's just like, oh, wow, this is nostalgic, but not overtly so. It's just kind of like, I was inspired by these movies that I watched as a kid, 
but I'm going to kind of like do my own thing with that inspiration. And these Stranger Thing comparisons are definitely there if you really want to do it, especially with the kid and the idea that the government's chasing him and he has these weird, almost psychic type, well, he does have psychic type powers and he could do shit with electricity and then when he really uses his power, his nose bleeds. Like, there's a lot there where you're like, well, someone should maybe contact the Duffer Brothers. Even a bit also, Jane Martell plays the kid, and you, yeah. some might recognize him as the main kid from the recent It movies, or at least the first one. He's, he's used better here, also better used than Book of Henry, our favorite. <laughs> I was going to say, for us, it's Book of Henry. That's where we know him from. That's true. Um. <laughs> also, he wore goggles, which creeped me the fuck out, because like, oh no. But dive back into the book. <laughs> It's just another chapter. Um, no, I really, really dug this movie, though, man. I, I think the acting in this movie uh, across the board is great. I'd say, you know, Kristen Dunst isn't given much to do in this, but she she does very well in what she is given. To me, the MVP is Edgerton in this. Uh, Edgerton and Shannon you know, in particular, they're both just fucking great. And it, Joel Edgerton, clearly it's it's him. I think he likes doing more weird sort of low-budget fare. Not necessarily low budget, but like independent sort of offshoot weird movies. But man, that guy's on the verge of just breaking out. I mean, he's so good in everything he's in. And Michael Shannon, you know, he's already established. But for this being like an early Adam Driver, he's really fucking good at it. And it, he, they do it so well, and he plays the character so well. Where yeah, he's like an NSA analyst or whatever, who's sort of just given this position. Well, now you're in charge of all of this, and you're the number one man on the Alton case, and blah, blah, blah. And you can see he's sort of like fumbling through it, but he's very smart. He can figure it all out. But when it comes to actually being face to face with Alden or face to face with what's going on, like his sort of whole belief system and what he's doing crumbles almost instantly. Well, there's a bit of that. And also what I think works about Driver in this movie is that he feels young. Like, it's not just he's put in this particular position. He also feels like, oh, I'm like maybe a couple years out of like grad school or something. And he's just like, oh shit, I'm doing something like huge and massive, catastrophic. Like, I love the bit where he's talking to Sam Shepard when they're interviewing him. And it's just like, so yeah, if you have all access to all this information, um, you would be breaking treason laws that have not even been established yet by the government. <laughs> if you were to get this, inf- how did you get this? So there's a bit of that, even from the start, he's just like, I'm incredibly curious how any of this happened. And then when he even meets Alton face to face, it's just like, I'm really excited to meet you, honestly. I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, everything he does is like, well, that's impressive. <laughs> like, yeah, it, yeah it's, I agree. He's he's just like, you know, still sort of wet behind the ears, just out of, probably just got this job like a year or two ago and sort of roused the ranks because of his intelligence, but is really sort of unprepared when it comes to face-to-face with sort of the entire enormity of what's happening book it's, smart not street smart it, very much a thousand percent a thousand percent and i also even though he's in it for all of three minutes fuck was this like my favorite era i know it sounds crazy but my favorite era of sam shepherd was like the mid-2000s still right when he passed away where he became a really small bit character actor and he just fucking nails it everything he's in including this he's fantastic also shout out to jeff nichols's mud which he's also incredible in like right before this, yes. he did that. amazing in that movie. Uh, but everyone here is, I agree, like Sam Shepard for his small part is very good. Someone as small in the rank is Bill Camp, who's one of my favorite, like very small character actors, who's the guy who's like following around Alton and like bursts down the door and everything. And earlier he says like, I'm an electrician certified in two states. What do I know about any of this? Why am I doing this right now? It's a great moment where like, this is one of these genre movies, but also like really getting in on like the intimate character moments. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. And the thing is, it's like he's got that moment where he's like, I, I shouldn't have a hand in this. Like you said, I'm and the one guy's like, well, if you didn't think you could handle it, then he wouldn't, uh, you know, let you come or let giving you the task or whatever. And then he turns out to be like almost the most ruthless one. Yep. <laughs> yes. That's one scene, too, that I really, really kind of dug. You know, spoiler alerts for anybody's listening to it, but where he shoots Joel Edgerton right outside the hotel room. And then Shannon pops out, shoots him in the stomach. And it's not overdone. Like, it's just quick you see his face reaction like holy shit i just got shot and then the most you get is just smears of blood after that on like the pillowcase and all that stuff it doesn't go really dirty and gross with it at all it's just the reality of the situation fuck i just got shot but i gotta keep going well and in general that's jeff Nichols' style which is what i really like about him he's a filmmaker that makes very kind of chill laid-back movies despite how like intense the situations can be 
in case like there's a realism to it even with like michael shannon who the first movie jeff nichols did was take shelter uh that i saw which is a tremendous movie for tremendous michael shannon performance and he screams a lot in that movie based on the actual premise of it here shannon i think is at his most like calm the most tense he gets is at points where the kid is in danger and he's just like don't you never leave the van what are you doing but that's it and I think that's it's such a great side of Shane. We don't even see a lot. No, you're right. Yeah, the, yeah, it's the that's probably the major. You know, I told you never to leave the van. He's like, I'm sorry. He's like, it's okay. And he instantly goes back to like sort of quiet, subdued. But dude, he does so much acting with just his eyes in this movie. Like he barely changes his facial expression. He smiles like once or twice, barely. But it's just all in the eyes in this, and it's it's fucking fantastic. Like you get even the scene where you know Kirsten Dunst in the in. Uh, Jaden leave the car and he's like Alden and Alden looks back at him and he just nods and just the look in his face is, is so it's so good one of two prominent bad boys two cast members we have to talk about tonight which is interesting as well oh yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> we'll get into that but um I I do agree and I also think what works is that with Jeff Nichols like this is his, obviously a sci-fi movie he's done mostly like smaller dramas with this I love also how even the effects work feels like it's very subdued and laid back like, whenever you see the kid's powers, it's just kind of like, oh, it's there, and it feels like it could be realistic to whatever this concept is, but it's really subtle, particularly the bit where um, Alton gets out of the car, and Kristen then follows him, and he's like starts vomiting on the grass, and it starts changing color, is a great example of how it's just like really subdued, but you see the impact of his powers at the same time. Yeah, definitely, and it's a very smart way to sort of show this kid's powers without really defining them. Like, we don't know exactly what this kid is capable of. But we, you know, you get the idea, like even with the grass and what he does with the satellite and things like that, like he's potentially incredibly dangerous. Uh, it just helps that he's a, it's in the body of this innocent sort of eight year old boy, because a grown adult, if they would have gotten his hands on him like they want to and sort of brainwash him and turn him into a weapon, he'd be unstoppable. I will say, though, with Jaden Martell, um, I like that get kid in general, I think, especially um in stuff like it or knives out i think he's been pretty fun this is probably my least favorite performance of his if nothing else because it feels too child actory in a way where like he's so subdued but even like his vocabulary and eloquence in a way that just feels like i don't know i don't quite have the connection with that kid i have it more when michael sheen is having that connection or joel edgerton is talking or kirsten dunst kirsten dunst has such a great scene where she's like sees him again for the first time in forever and she gets really emotional about it phenomenal scene I think they're doing the heavy lifting around him. Obviously, he's a kid. Can't really judge him that harshly. But th- even for a really good kid actor like him, I think it's my least favorite performance of his I've seen. That's not Book of Henry bad, you know. Right. Well, I was going to say, right. Uh, so, like, top echelon for you would be Book of Henry. Uh, I mean, that's just, that's unfair to all child actors in general. That is the best child actor performance in anything, is Book of Henry. We all know that. It's, it's, the, best, it's the best written movie ever. I mean, right, I, that's I, true. Anyway. Just, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what a piece of shit. Um... Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with you. I, I, he didn't bother me. It, it's just, it's that typical, you do see it a lot in child actors, especially around his age in this. He's only, he's supposed to be eight. And, you know, he's this, like, sort of otherworldly kid. Or you also get it when kids are haunted or they're ghosts. They get this sort of woodenness about them where they just sort of stare. And that's kind of, I get it. It is a kid trying to do what he thinks he should do, but they just, it just comes off a little robotic. This is what it feels like when people kind of complain about maybe the Haley Joel Osment performance in Sixth Sense, which I don't agree with. This is that's what... ridiculous. I don't yeah, agree with ridiculous. that. Yeah, but I think this feels more the case of just like this feels Shyamalan esque, as it were, but not quite implemented as well. Especially because I think Jeff Nichols has had a really great job with child actors like Mud. I love the main kids in Mud. I think they are such like believable, awesome kid characters that I, I just wasn't as big on him here. But regardless, he still is like the outlet for a lot of like great little sci-fi conceits and back and forth that go on. And like you mentioned with like Adam Driver or his father or Joe. Ed- Joe Edgerton is so fascinating as his character because he has this uh, whole backstory of like, oh yeah, before he joined the commune, he was the, Michael Shannon was a regular kid. And like I knew him growing up and then he disappeared. And they just called me out of the blue to help him out. And I'm willing to help him out because I, you know, I want to get his kid out of there. Even though I'm a state trooper. I love that bit with Kristen Dunst where he's like, I'm a state trooper. And it's so cool because it's such a good throwback because when he actually shoots a highway patrolman and then he gets right on the radio and he knows all the codes and stuff. I was like, what the fuck? How? 
Like, I was like, this is a little ridiculous. And then, of course, you know, oh, he would know all of that stuff. It completely makes sense. And just to sort of see the the curiosity and the bewilderment of what, you know, Elton is through Joel Edgerton's character is pretty spectacular. Like, when they come back to the hotel room in the daytime, and Joel Edgerton's eyes are just a sheet of water the whole time because he's just, he's not even crying, but he's just watery-eyed because he's sort of, amazed about what he's hearing and what he's seeing. Like, it's just constantly another layer with this story that he's involved in. And uh, he's super solid. Super, super solid in this. This movie is very consistently good throughout, but it kind of peaks for me at the opening sequence where, like, they're in the hotel room and it's like, all right, we're going to go to the kid. And they leave and they get in that car and it's like, oh, they're looking after us quick. Get the night vision goggles, and they turn off the headlights, and they put on night vision goggles, and the kid kills the flashlight in the back, and the they're driving on the dark, completely black road, and they've got night vision goggles on. Is such a stellar fucking opening sequence for this movie that immediately got me hooked into it. And the fact that it's basically all sound design. I mean, yeah, you get it's just such a dark image. You see little flashes of you know reflections and things like that. But yeah, I was like really hooked because i knew sort of you know i knew the plot for the most part but i didn't i went in basically kind of cold and uh that's just i'm like what the fuck is going on already like what how do these why do they have night vision goggles like what the fuck is going on who are these guys and uh yeah i was i was hooked line and sinker like basically from the opening and it also helps that the score on this is very very good I love that it's synthy, but not in, like, speaking of Stranger Things, like, I like that main theme for Stranger Things, but, like, that became the aesthetic for so much of, like, anything vaguely referencing sci-fi. It's just like, oh, it sounds like this particular kind of synthy score, John Carpenter-esque. And this one feels like it's there, but it's kind of subdued in a way where the whole movie, honestly, also reminds me a lot, speaking of John Carpenter, of something like Starman. It has that kind of vibe where it's like, yeah, this is sci-fi, but this is way more character-focused and quiet. I think it's a very good comparison. I, I agree with that 100%. Um, it's definitely that. It's like I said, it's definitely a slow burn sort of road movie that ultimately has sci-fi, you know, undertones or whatever. I mean, whatever you want to call it, but it is ultimately a relationship road movie. And it's, uh, I, I just, I, I don't think it's a perfect movie. Like I said, I, I still, you know, like ultimately the end, I don't know what the fuck is happening. Like, I don't know we're looking at or what it is if he's an alien or if it is just some other kind of like angels or other kind of may i offer my my opinion based on seeing this a second time yeah i you know i'm asking that on this podcast i never do that so i just gotta make sure yeah yeah. so yeah yes so my i like they keep talking about how oh i'm from like a world that's above ours um i think it's like an alternate dimension thing basically and this is like the one time that we're like both places can occupy the same space. And so that's why he's able to go in. So I think it's more of just like, it's a dimensional I rift. Right. Yeah, where people have the same wavelengths and everything. And I think that's when he's able to get in there. And I think that that's a really interesting way. And especially the creative way that's shown during that whole final scene, where it's just like, oh, structures we've never seen before are above us. On um, like, look, this gas station is like, all of a sudden there's a giant fucking tower that looks alien, but not inhuman. Like, it looks believable, like, oh, this is, like, um, human architecture in the next, like, 50 years, maybe, or so. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. My favorite reveal of that was the skyscraper. Yes. You know, it's showing, and all of a sudden, there's this giant sort of structure jutting out of the side of it that is just completely unlike the rest of the building. Uh, Yeah, I I think think you're probably right. I think it is, like, sort of a uh, other dimension, you know, Stephen Hawking-esque sort of theory idea about it. I, I think that's probably very, very accurate. This movie cost $18 million to make, and it looks, like, stunning in this way. And it looks like it's believably building a world while at the same time you're mostly seeing, like, the inside of hotel rooms or old houses. And it was making me curious for right until, like, I think a month ago, Jeff Nichols' next movie was going to be that A Quiet Place spinoff. Not three, but allegedly Whoa. a spinoff. And then he said, like, nah, I'm going to do something different. I'm like, good. Do something, like, that I would give a shit about <laughs> Yeah, that's probably for the best. <laughs> yes, after A Quiet Place 2, for sure. But Adam, speaking of twos, we have a whole other movie to talk about quite a bit. So let's do our final thoughts here on Midnight Special, please. As the guy who picked it, your final thoughts on this movie, and particularly Adam Driver in it. 
I think Adam Driver's great in it. I think it's a great supporting turn uh, from him. You know, obviously he wasn't really the Adam Driver he is now yet, but it's still, you can see just how, what talent the guy has, even in an early sort of side role like this. I, I think he's perfect as sort of the foil of both the heroes and sort of the people he's working for. It, it, it just really, really works. Um, and other than that, I, like I said, I think it's a it's a damn fine movie. It's a good slow burn sci-fi. I'm always on board for those. It's anchored by just wonderful performances, great score. Eight ten million dollar budget is insane because it looks like it's easily double that. The thing is, if you're going to go into it, you got to know that it is not an action, really an action heavy piece. It's a lot of quiet moments. The whole movie is basically based around quiet moments and sort of looks and things like that, especially with our major leads. But if you can take a movie like that, if you enjoy a movie like that, then I, I think you'd, you'd do well with this one. Completely agree. I think it fits perfectly in Jeff Nichols' filmography while also being reverential of some older science fiction classics. Um, and it's a great use of driver. It's interesting you mentioned he's not the driver that he would end up being. He got the news he was going to be in Star Wars on the set of this movie, his first day filming this movie. And you can see that kind of like he is like growing out the Kylo hair a bit. <laughs> he's got like a curl, hasn't gotten full Anakin Skywalker <laughs> thing yet that he has in the movie ultimately. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, it's, a, it's a really great movie and a really great use of him and all the other actors, Michael Shannon and Joel Edgerton, everyone is quite good in it. And if you didn't see it, because it wasn't very successful when it came out. I remember seeing this in the theater being like one of three people, I think, when it came out. I, we would both definitely recommend seeing it. It's a little hidden gem for all you out there. Yeah, definitely. Those are my favorites. Yes. But we have a whole other film to talk about, Adam, after this promo for an ESO show you can queue up right after ours. Hello there. I can see you have great taste in podcasts. Keep your discerning streak going with the Soul Forge podcast. No topic is off limits on the Soul Forge. We talk about life, toys, dating, geekiness, love, nerdiness, sex and dating, TV, movies, and just about anything you can think of. Check out the Soul Forge podcast. Soulforgepodcast.com and wherever you find your podcasts. We're everywhere. All right, and now we are getting to our second film, The Man Who Killed Don Quixote. I was born by the special will of heaven to restore the lost age of chivalry. I am Don Quixote de la Mancha. And cut right there. Good work. I want to drop some of the shots. Why? Because it isn't working. Because my client isn't happy. Because the whole concept is ridiculous. You are Don Quixote. Javier? Sancho? You crazy peasant. <laughs> Don Quixote de la Mancha. Come to restore the lost age of chivalry. Well, I wrote that. Why does everything always have to be about you, Sancho? Me, 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 me. I am Don Quixote. So the man who killed Don Quixote came out uh, May 19th, 2018 in Spain. You know, we like giving context for movies. I have like a list of trivia factoids I give to you and a little notes sheet. Um, I think more than any other movie we've covered on the show, this requires an intense amount of like context for what it is. Would you agree? Yeah, there's already a documentary about it and there's another one coming. They, they're able to fill four hours of documentary just talking about how, how it came to be. It's insane. Yes, so for those of you who don't know, um, this is The Man Who Killed Don Quixote is a film uh, from Terry Gilliam, who we've talked about on the show previously. We did Brazil a while ago. Um, this movie was originally conceived back in 1989 by Gilliam um, when he wanted to do like a Don Quixote story. He's done plenty of Don Quixote style stories, like Brazil, Adventures of Baron Munchausen. There's a, that kind of vibe of like, oh, I'm a hero who has to fight even though it seems hopeless. There's no way I could possibly win. I'm still going to keep fighting. And he fought throughout this whole production process in 1989, tried to do it. No, nothing ever happened. 1995, he almost tried to get it to happen, but it didn't. Then 1998, he infamously got a whole production set up and had people cast and uh, was on the first week of shooting for a $32 million budget. Um, everything went wrong. And this was all documented in, as Adam kind of mentioned, there's this documentary called Lost in La Mancha, 
which I would describe basically as a DVD bonus feature that goes awry. It was originally conceived as like a making of documentary for TV or a DVD uh, made by people who had done that for 12 Monkeys. And it's like you're watching it on a, what would be like a DVD of this particular movie. It's like, oh my god, this is how it was made. And then, oh no, it didn't get made. It didn't happen. And it's uh, it's devastating to watch, honestly. Would you agree, Adam? You've seen the documentary as well. Yeah, it, it, it is in a way that it just shows the ultimate struggle of committing to your art, committing to you know your vision, and ultimately how just things beyond your control can just destroy you know, your art, your vision. It, it, it's its pretty harrowing, especially when, if you look at it from sort of the perspective of an established filmmaker or a filmmaker in general. Yeah, it, it's its a pretty much a bummer. Though not just from the director, even just everyone in that cast and crew. There's a certain point where everything's screwed, but Terry Gilliam has to go around to the costume guys and the special effects people, just like, guys, it looks great. I can't wait to use it on the movie. That's never going to get finished because everything went wrong. <laughs> He can't tell anybody because of the insurance stuff. It's crazy. It's a great documentary. Seek it out. But that happened in like 2000 or so. 2000. So then he tried for the next 18 years to get this done. Several people came in and out as like the Don Quixote character. And the script was rewritten several times. And it's just eventually finally came out uh, with Adam Driver as this character who basically, if you're aware of Don Quixote, this is a bit of a twist on it where um, he plays this guy who's a director of a commercial that's parodying Don Quixote for uh, this oil company. He's, he's telling everybody, like, oh, hey, yeah, we're going to do this and this. He's like an asshole Hollywood-type director who's being bankrolled by the guy who runs the company. He's just like, yeah, we love this guy. Let him do the commercials, whatever. He's played by Stellan Skarsgård, who's a total piece of shit. But they end up shooting near this location where, years ago, Adam Driver had been to shoot a independent film, his student film, which he finds a DVD of in the middle of, like, this guy who's, like, selling DVDs. He's suddenly like, heck, here, sir, how about this one? Like, wait, this is my student film. He watches it again, he visits the town again, and finds everyone kind of remembers him, but in this, like, way that's haunted everyone, particularly the man who played his Don Quixote in his student film, who was played here by Jonathan Price. And as it turns out, Jonathan Price is was so obsessed after playing that character in the student film that he has become Don Quixote in our real life. And he is going around saying he's Don Quixote, trying to look for Sancho. He thinks Adam Driver is a Sancho. That's what he recognizes him as. There's a lot more to go with from there. But Adam, with that context of the documentary, and then finally seeing this film version for the first time, what did you think of it? I mean, to be completely transparent, I don't, I don't know. This is either genius or it's just pretentious sort of masturbation. I, I, I really, I like a lot of stuff about it. I, I particularly, Jonathan Price is fucking, what a performance. It, it's kind of masterful. Adam Driver does a lot of good comedy bits in this, just from reactions and, you know, the whole dance scene that he does and all that stuff. But I, I really don't know. This is one that I finished today that was a disservice for this show because I, I think I need some time with this to sit on it. Maybe give it another shot too because uh, I think there's a lot here. But I think watching the documentary before I've seen this sort of took me out of the actual movie and it really sort of all I was thinking about was the mythology of making the movie. So I think I did the movie a disservice in that way too. Well, Adam, um, I'm glad you mentioned that whole thing about you just watching it earlier today. I watched this a couple days ago. And I have been thinking about it constantly, like the sort of build up to this, because along with all that build up about the documentary and the production of this particular movie, I said this when we talked about Brazil, but I don't think I really emphasized that um, Terry Gilliam was sort of like a stepping stone for me in terms of becoming the film obsessive person that I was, because along with being obsessed with film starting around like middle school and high school, I started moving on to like more adult things. One of the things I moved on to was Monty Python, which Terry Gilliam was a part of. And I followed, like, all the stuff, like the movies and the TV shows that they did and all the interviews and behind-the-scenes stuff. I had a book that was, like, all these guys being interviewed. And Terry Gilliam was one of the ones where I think he's had such an interesting career post his Python work where, like, he went on to make all these different movies like Time Bandits, Brazil, Baron Munchausen. Like, I rewatched Baron Munchausen earlier this week, and that was the first one of his I ever watched. And I think that movie still is a fascinating film about just, like, 
getting older and realizing you don't have the same touch, but still having that sense of adventure and how worrying that is. A lot of the same themes of this movie. And I think that's what makes, like, especially also Terry Gilliam's, like, behind the scenes stuff we talked about in Brazil and but there's been several other times where he's always had a lot of trouble with his productions and a lot of that comes from studio interference stupid shit like Stellan Skarsgård in this movie heavily based on Harvey Weinstein based on like his he's had interactions with that dude and it seems very (laughs) yes there's a bit of that but also this movie I find so fascinating is what he hasn't said he's going to do any other movies. He's been just so focused on making this movie and putting it out. Only came out a couple years ago. I wish no ill will toward Terry Gilliam, um, even though he said some asshole things. Like, if this might be his last movie, potentially, it's a perfect note to end on, but in the most kind of sad, pathetic way to me. This is a movie about a filmmaker who wants to, like, not give a shit about making movies. He's like, I'm doing this now not for the art anymore. I'm doing it for commercial gains. This is a commercial. I don't give a shit. I'm completely corrupting this thing I once held dear. But then he tries to go back to his student film, and in other movies, that might be the thing where he's like, you know what? He starts to realize the love of filmmaking he once had and really appreciates it. No, he goes back and he finds out that him making movies um, was a terrible thing that hurt so many people. Not just Jonathan Price, um, who I think I agree is doing a very good job in this movie. But he's hurt so many other people around him, including this one woman who was like the female lead of his student film, who um, there's a lot of implications with that I'm not a fan of either. But this is a movie made by somebody who has gone through the production process so many times and has been burned so many times. So it comes off as bitter filmmaking in a way that fascinates me, but um, still makes I don't think for a good movie. If that made any sense, that rambling. I just no, I, 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 no I, I completely understand what you mean. Uh, and the one thing I do find fascinating about this movie as well, because it is Terry Gilliam and things like that, it's almost like both facets of Terry Gilliam are represented by both of our leads in this movie. You got sort of the filmmaker, the one who's sort of given up and blah, blah, blah with the Toby character, you know, Adam driver. And then you got the guy who's so still far in his fantasy and, and is just committed to doing this and committed to this in the Coyote character. It's almost like you're literally watching this weird, bizarre biopic about Terry Gilliam. The filmmaker and the old man particularly yeah. the old man element of it is like right there with Jonathan Price, who was obviously not the first person um, to be tasked with the role. A lot of other older men like um, John Hurt, who the movie's dedicated to Jean Rochefeld, who was the guy who was going to be in the, uh, the first production that fell apart. Um, they're both the dedicatees of this movie. And I think my big problem with Jonathan Price's character is more just, I love his energy. It's perfect for Don Quixote, which is a story I love, but also it feels weird for like, a guy who's just like, oh, English is my second language. And Sancho, you can't read English. Only I can. Jonathan, you're very British. <laughs> you're yeah, yeah, so yeah, no, no, extremely no. British. It, it doesn't quite work there. That's the biggest problem I have with this casting. Otherwise, he's very good in this movie. But it feels so weird. Where especially the only Spanish person is playing a, a Russian in this movie. Who we kind of referenced earlier. The guy from Bad Boys 2. The, the villain. Yeah, Jordi Mala. Right, it's so um, he's the only Spanish person in this movie. I know, I know. No, I mean, yeah, I I get that. I just think the the sort of whimsical nature that Jonathan Price is able to portray in this, where you know he's so steadfast and really, you know, I'm a basically I'm a knight, and then he'll you know make a fart noise and a silly face and stuff like that. It just it really worked for me. Uh, the whole look of Don Quixote and his armor and all stuff, and then when it sort of goes back to the past, and then. You know, or sort of the story of Don Quixote while Adam Driver is sort of dreaming or whatever you want to call it and how it sort of intersects and everything. It, it's just it's really, really well done. And then, you know, it's cool to find out that a lot of the sets and locations used in this were the same sets and locations scouted for the 2003 version. That that also comes into another interesting factor is that, yes, some of that stuff was at least designed the same way some of the locations were going to be the same. But this is not quite the movie apparently that the 2000 movie like if you look at that documentary like any of the costumes that were going to be designed and the special effects work particularly um none of that is here because they cut the budget in half to 16 million and even when they in lost in la mancha terry gilliam says 32 million dollars for this production is half of what i need so this is so extremely scaled down no no definitely you could see it you could see it in some of the parts especially like sort of some of the cgi and stuff 
Mm -hmm. uh, you can tell the budget's not really there. And also, you know, this movie has one flaw that I, I really wish they didn't do. Well, they, it has a lot of flaws. But one of the things I really wish it didn't do, I really wish that, like, the terrorism sub-angle wasn't there. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a huge fan of. And also, like, sort of a Trump reference and all that. Like, it instantly dates the movie. And to me, you know, you're telling the story of Don Quixote of La Mancha. And, and however you want to tell it. If you want to tell it sort of in a modern context or a period piece, however you want to do it, it should sort of be a timeless story. And to me, they dated themselves a little bit with a couple of sort of the references and just some of the throwaway jokes and stuff. I, I just, to me, that was really sort of unnecessary. What's interesting also with the Trump reference is that feels like the most contemporary reference because even like the Middle Eastern sort of like terrorist parody thing you're talking about, some other stuff, it feels straight out of like, you never updated this from 2000, did you, Terry? Like, there's so much stuff that's just like, this is an old ass script you dusted off. Oh, no. And yeah. did like some stuff for budget cuts, but not a lot of the references, not a lot of like the big things that some of these people do. And even, I gotta talk about our man of the hour, Adam Driver, to me, yeah. is like massively miscast in this movie. It doesn't really work for me at all. Any, like, most of the humor he tries to do so much because the person who was gonna do this in the 2000 movie was gonna be Johnny Depp, who is a. Uh, worked with Terry Gilliam before. I hate to say this. 2000 era Johnny Depp would have worked really well in this part. Cause, but uh, it's, I feel like it is the case because it feel, he's like slimy, but he feels like, all right, and Toby's supposed to be a guy where you see him initially, you like have a drink with him, maybe have a night out with him. And you're like, oh my God, this guy's really charming. And then the moment you wake up, it's like, oh, this was a massive mistake. Get the fuck out of my life. Adam Driver never feels in this movie like he's quite that charming to start out with. He just kind of feels that consistent, like, I don't want to be around you for, like, five minutes. <laughs> You're awful. Get the fuck away from me. I, I agree with that. Uh, but his comedy bits still did work for me, especially just some of the line delivery. You know, he'd see something, oh, what the fuck? Like, just, it'd be so quick and quiet, and it would just work for me. Uh, but, no, I, I completely get what you mean. And, and you're probably onto something there. There, There is not one moment of this movie, maybe back when it shows him in the very first flashback when he's sort of young and starting out and how excited he is to make the movie and stuff then you get it but as modern day toby no he's a fucking douchebag a hundred percent a douchebag with his little beads and all that shit yeah it is weasel stash yeah he sucks either depp or um ewan mcgregor was also at one point going to be cast with like michael palin when he was going to be another monty python person was going to be don quixote that might have worked a bit better I don't know, but um, at, at the same time, like, even when he's in the flashbacks you're talking about, where he's like, oh, I'm young, and I'm trying to shoot this movie, and I'm going to get Angelica, who's played by Joanna Ribeiro, who I will say I think is one of the better performers, and I think works pretty well for this particular part. I just hate so much that when he is, like, sort of um, getting her to star in the movie, and she's, like, 15, but there's no sexual yeah. stuff at that point, and then 10 years later when he returns and sees her again... It's like, oh, hey, how are you, 25-year-old? How are you doing? It feels very grooming in a way that I was, like, not interested in. Then also, it doesn't help that she's become um, a sex worker, and he is trying yes. to save her out of that. In a way that's, like, that's part of Don Quixote, D Dulcinea, all that stuff is yeah. that's there in the original text. But also, this movie has so many mixed metaphors in this current version. This feels like a thing that was, like, gone through so many different drafts since, like, Dude, I don't know what you and Tony Grisoni, who was his co-writer here, also wrote Fear and Loathing with him, adapted that. Like, I don't know what you guys, this script, whatever this is, is so diluted, and I don't know what exactly you're trying to say. Beyond the big thing they added was apparently Terry Gilliam saying, throughout production, when things got smaller and smaller, the main thing I wanted to add was, movies hurt people. Movies do so much damage. And I feel like that's kind of the weird state he's in, which is incredibly unique and you never see a movie go that like meta textually upsetting but this movie does that in a way that i find so fascinating but appropriately upsetting it's just it's really fucking sad to see it just feels like an angry old man who's you know if you want to say anything about terry gilliam he's an angry bitter dude and it just feels like him throwing that out on the screen for, you know, whether that's his personal ideas or not, you know, you know, movies can hurt people and they can do this and blah, 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 blah. I get it, but it does feel a little bit like forced fed. Yeah. And it feels like it's also him getting out because they hurt a lot of people, Terry. I'm not necessarily disagreeing with that, but also it feels like they hurt you a lot 
more specifically. I agree a thousand yeah. percent. It feels like he's really hurt by it and everything like that. And I understand. And, you know, yeah, movies can, movies can hurt people and stuff like that. And movies also give people a goal in life or create fantasy worlds for escapism for some people and stuff like that. So, I mean, just taking a staunch, like, stance, like, oh, no, movies fuck you up. And that being it, is it's kind of like, yeah, it's depressing. It's a bummer. Especially considering, like, he's done so many different versions. Like I mentioned, I rewatched Baron Munchausen. That's a movie that went through a lot of production problems. That's a movie that had intense, like, horrible, like, reception and box office and really, like, damaged his career for a bit. But it's also very similar thematically to this. And also the movie he followed that up with, uh, The Fisher King with Robin Williams, is a very Don Quixote story. It's a great movie. I love that movie, too, about just how it kind of shows, like, look, people can live, like, these fantasy lives, and they can have, like, these obsessions, and it can get to a point where it's just, like, yeah, like, face reality a bit, but he was able to mix that up so perfectly, like, in Baron Munchausen, Jonathan Price's character is a dude who's just like, oh, hey, we can let the wars go on, let people get bombed, but we're gonna negotiate a surrender with the enemy, and it's like, oh, you'll surrender on Wednesday after you've bombed this one particular land, like, he has that cynicism that's always been baked in his career, but he's able to mix that with an excited whimsy that I guess is just more youthful. At this point, that youthful whimsy is gone. And all that's left is the cynicism. And that's incredibly fascinating, but a bummer that that happened to him. But I say all of this, part of that has to be fucking Gilliam, though, with some of these production things. Like, if the same thing happens yeah. to the same dude on the bus multiple times, there's a recurring factor of you on the bus, as well as maybe an asshole driver. That was the <laughs> same there's no doubt in my mind that he's problematic yeah. and that, you know, stands ground, but to a fault. I, I absolutely agree with that. I, you know, Terry Gilliam's got issues. Yep. Uh, him. And also uh, speaking of Monty Python, like a John Cleese are in a very similar boat, I think at this point, yes. if you, yes, if you follow any of their comments. Uh, so what I'm saying is Eric Idle, Michael Palin, you guys are still alive. Please stay great. And keep making money. Eric, I, you yep. make all the money you want off, like, kids' movies or you do a voice. You're great. Just don't do anything asshole <laughs> and you, you'll be great in my book. Yep, I agree. Yes. Um, but, I mean, before we go, I just want to also mention, like, the finale of this movie has, I think, is the key point of so much cynicism we're talking about. That fits appropriately for Don Quixote, which is something I was introduced to through, like, the musical Man of La Mancha and... I read Don Quixote when I was in school and stuff. And I love that story. And I love the idea of, especially at the very end, the whole tragedy of that story is Don Quixote, this old man who believes he's a knight and can get rid of windmills that like go around and all this other stuff. He's so fascinated with just like, nope, I have, to, I have this fantasy of who I am and everyone around me who's like my loyal sidekick and my Dulcinea I'm trying to rescue. By the end of that story, he's like, oh, hey, um, I'm dying. It's awful. And I realize I'm just an old man. I was never a knight. I, I never could have done that. And then he fades away. That is such a beautiful, tragic thing where, like, after that, his story lives on in legend, pretty much. And here, the story lives on with, like, Adam Driver, like, oh, no, Jonathan Price has died through these complicated circumstances. And now I am suddenly sort of infused with the energy of a Don Quixote. So that spirit still lives on, but within the spectrum of this, like, commercialistic piece-of-shit director who is just like, oh, I guess now I have nothing, so I'll become a Don Quixote, and I won't have any kind of, like, job or any ability to, like, really help myself or anybody around me, but I'm Don Quixote, Man of La Mancha. That's what it means. That's what, like, the curse that's being carried around. This is, like, the lament configuration is what Don Quixote is for Terry Gilliam. Just like, yep, keeps on going. Just it always ends up in a different place. Somebody else has to be Don Quixote. This is the staff you must hold for life. This is your purpose. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, I, I I think you said it pretty well. I, I I was not a big big fan of the ending either. I, it just I, I found myself getting mentally checked out around the reintroduction of the Alejandro character, and then it started like there was a couple peaks, but a lot of alleys. Yeah, like shout out to jo uh, Jordi Malia, who we mentioned earlier from Bad Boys Two, among some other yeah. things. I think he's incredible in this movie as like the Russian yeah, producer, producer dude. Who immediately is just like, oh, this guy exists. He probably is a buddy of Weinstein or something. This character is like, it, it feels like that same kind of like awful abuse of power. It's so awful. Like, that's the thing is, while I'm saying all this stuff, I've said so much, but it's a great mix of different types of profound sadness. 
where there's a profundity of like, oh, this is like a really insightful thing to say. So much wisdom packed into it. And also profundity of just like, there's just a quantity of shit that gives me bad vibes, man. <laughs> just bad all around. Like a huge amount of it. Some of it profound, a lot of it also just shitty. And I think that's kind of where I lie on it here. Adam, I've talked too much. Do you have anything else to add I haven't about Man Who Killed Don Quixote with your final thoughts? Uh, I mean, I'll just sort of group it together. I... I... I agree with pretty much everything you said. I, I do want to sort of maybe try to rewatch this not anytime soon. I want to sit with it first and, and then really decide if it's something I want to go back to. This movie definitely falls in, you know, that sort of rare category where everything leading up to the making of this movie and sort of the mystique of it and, you know, the Orson Welles of it at one point and all that is a much more fascinating thing than the actual product became. The production, the stories, and the thing is way more fascinating, which is unfortunate, especially with the talent involved. Right, which is why I would say I would definitely recommend anybody watch The Lost in La Mancha before this, even though you said that kind of took you out. I think you'll get the most entertainment out of this or fascination I... with it by watching the documentary first. Yeah, or at least just watching the documentary. But um, as opposed to this movie, yeah, I, like, I had a lot of package going into this, clearly, from what we've been talking about here. Um, and which is why it's not his worst movie by any means, Terry Gilliams, because he's also done like Brothers Grimm and Tideland. Tideland is like ugly. Fucking Zero Theorem. Oh, Zero Theorem is very bad too. Very bad, worse than this. I would say ever since the new millennium, he's only made one good movie, I would argue, is uh, Imagineering of Dr. Parnassus, which I liked. And even that's another movie that went, um, hmm, it had a really bad production thing. What happened? Oh, yeah, Heath Ledger died. And he's like one of the main stars of the movie. That fucking happened. So that alone shows, like, this. Terry Gilliam's been through so much shit, and I love so many of his movies still, even though he it seems to be an asshole based on what he's been putting out there, and it's unfortunate. I still love a lot of his movies. I would still say a lot of his, like, earlier movies are fascinating. I would say the run from Monty Python, The Holy Grail, to Fear and Loathing is a range of, like, pretty good to phenomenal filmmaking but i still love still have a lot of affection for somewhat nostalgically mostly a lot just like on weird filmmaking craft and i respect a lot of what that dude's done but also this movie i think while it won't be his worst movie or if it ends up being his last movie i don't think it'll be sort of like a a bad note that a lot of directors end up on where it's just like oh you made something anonymous no one cares about as your last movie that's a shame this is distinctly terry gilliam for all of the good and a lot of the bad reasons. It's it's just so distinct like him. And it's a punctuation note that feels appropriate for Terry. But also uh, just a really sad one on so many levels. Somewhat fascinatingly, mostly not. But yeah, that's that's the impossible dream he may go out on. So anyway, uh, let's get into our next segment. The Double oh, Redo. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. I got my grandma's funeral flyer somewhere. Let me go get that and read it, too. <laughs> Ad, Adam, while I'm recovering, can you introduce the Double Reduce segment maybe for people out there? Why don't you introduce it quickly? Yeah, so it's a new segment in our show. It's, we've been doing it for a couple months now. It's called the Double Redo. What we do is Thomas and I will recommend two movies, both bad, both good, uh, related to our topic in case you're interested in sort of finding more out there related to whatever particular topic we do. And this week, obviously, uh, we're talking all about Adam Driver performances. So, uh, Thomas, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Yes, so for Adam Driver, I'll start off with my good. Um, I'll start off with the older one, slightly, from 2016. I have his first of two collaborations with Mr. Jim Jarmusch Patterson, which, if you don't know, is basically about um, Adam Driver plays a guy named Patterson in Patterson, New Jersey, who is a bus driver, but he's also a poet. So he likes to write down a lot of poems in his little book that he has on the bus. He hears conversations that go on. He has a lovely wife at home and a dog who he loves walking around. And like any Jim Jarmusch movie, um, it has a real slice of life quality. There's also a lot of weird, bizarre details that are fascinating. Like there's a bit where he's walking his dog at him driver and he goes down and hears somebody doing something, maybe like a rap of some sort. Oh, it's a laundromat. Who's there? It's Method Man. Literally fucking Method Man is there performing a rap. And he looks down at Adam Driver's dog like, yo, what's up? Come on, come over here. And the dog like barks and runs away. And Adam Driver's like, you're doing a great job. Love that stuff. And I think that's what's so interesting is it's a real slice of life movie that has an ASMR kind of quality where you're watching it just like, I'm not infused with like a lot of drama and stakes. 
But I like chilling out with these people. I like living this weird existence with a cab driver and his wife, who's um, this Iranian woman, I forgot the actress's name, I apologize, who wants to be a country singer and likes to paint spirals and stuff around the house and shit like that. It's quirky, but in a way that feels very sincere and calm and genuine in a way that I really dug. And I think especially Driver has this like great thing where he feels like he would be like the neighborhood bus driver who you would see just like, oh, I love this guy. I love seeing him on my route. And just like, hey, what's up, man? Here's your change. And then going. I, I think it, it's an incredible movie. It's on Amazon. It's one of the weird, like, Amazon funded this. It put out in theaters kind of movies. And it's it's a pretty great one for that. And then um, the more recent one I have came out a couple months ago. Uh, though it won't be in your local theater probably at the, the time you're hearing this. It's The Last Duel. The first of two Ridley Scott collaborations that Adam Driver did this year. And basically, this is a story about these this knight and his wife. Uh, the knight is played by Matt Damon, who co-wrote the script with Ben Affleck, who shows up here. This is their first script collaborating since uh, Good Will Hunting. And uh, the uh, Matt Damon character is about to have a duel with Adam Driver, who plays this other knight, who, as it turns out, they were friends. And we get three different perspectives on why they're having this duel. One from Matt Damon's perspective... One from Adam Driver's perspective, then one from the perspective of Adam Driver's wife, who I forgot the name of the actress, but she was in Free Guy recently, and she's a very good actress. And basically, um, it is the telling of how this assault, I don't want to go into spoilers too much, but some trigger warning, there's like some sexual assault that happened in the course of the story. And the way that Affleck, Damon, and their third co-writer, Nicole Hofstetter, who also did like Enough Said, the great... Uh, rom-com with Julia Dreyfus and James Gandolfini before he passed away and uh, wrote like Can You Ever Forgive Me the Melissa McCarthy movie that came out a couple years ago it's a tremendous movie about just like what pers- different perspectives mean and ultimately what the truth is the movie has a very clear definition of like who the truth is if you just look at the titles that pop up between segments but everyone's really great in it Matt Damon's really good Ben Affleck is so funny in this movie he's a great comedic relief but Driver is so fascinating because he infuses his character with so much of a friendliness to Matt Damon, um, a boisterous charm that would make him like, oh, he's a dashing knight of old, and then a sick son of a bitch. Like, an awful, awful sick person who you can't... You just want to get up the fuck away from him. It He does show so much range in this movie. And also, uh, the final, the titular duel, um, is one of the most intense, awful duels I've ever seen. It's like, imagine watching this interesting knight... Uh, medieval movie happen and then the ending is like the alley fight and they live but with swords <laughs> it's intense and gory and awful and i won't say who uh wins that battle but um it's a great movie worth your two and a half hours of time now too bad briefly on this one uh this is where i leave you a movie that came out in 2014 that adam driver's part of an ensemble it's uh he plays the brother of jason bateman and jason bateman is the main character who goes down for his dad's funeral after a big breakup with his ex-wife, who was cheating on him, and uh, they end up going to, uh, he goes to his family's house, where he meets up with his brothers, played by Adam Driver, but also Corey Stoll, and his sister, played by Tina Fey, and his mother, played by Jane Fonda, and the whole thing is they're a Jewish family, and it's like, oh, your dad's last wish was that you all sit down for, I believe it's Shiva, I might be mispronouncing that. I apologize if I got that wrong. It's been a few days since I've seen this movie. But the movie is basically them having to stay in Jane Fonda's house and sit for like a week and just chill out together, talk to each other. Kind of like a big chill thing, only um, it's really vapid and dull and made by Sean Levy, who also made Free Guy um, and is a tremendous waste of most of this cast. Also miscasting given of the people I listed who are in that family that's clearly very Jewish based on the Shiva thing. Um, only Corey Stoll is actually Jewish. And it feels that way. It feels like he's like the only person who kind of gets this. Everyone else is deeply out of their element. And Adam Driver has a few fun things that happen. He's kind of like the screw up, fuck up brother who has some fun, like one liners, kind of like we talked about with Don Quixote. But um, he is still ultimately very wasted along with the rest of the cast. And, you know, speaking of which, I just came back from this movie before we were about to record this show, the auspice for us doing Adam Driver. House of Gucci is my other bad pick. I didn't like it very much. I think it's such a waste of everyone here. Ridley Scott, I think, is way more indulgent than he is in The Last Duel. Both movies are about two and a half hours long. This one feels at least like, is this a director's cut, Ridley? Because every scene goes on for five minutes too long. I think it's Adam Driver's worst performance, honestly. Because he is supposed to be falling in love with Lady Gaga, who's quite good in the movie. But it's so one-sided. And it feels so much like Adam Driver is barely sentient in this movie which is how stiff he is and how he like wants to be with lady gaga but wants to defy his family the gucci's and 
amongst this great cast of like um, other people, Jeremy Irons, Selma Hayek, Al Pacino, um, most of them are trying very hard. And I hate to say this too. My favorite part about this movie is Jared Leto in a bunch of makeup as the brother. I'm stunned. I don't like that guy a lot normally. Even his performances in the last few years, I think, have been quite dull. He's very funny. He's like the great comedic relief of this movie. He's so stellar every time he shows up. He has this makeup on that makes him look like Joe Spinell from Maniac. Um, and he's tremendous every time he shows up. But otherwise, yeah, it's it's such a dull affair. But I was not a fan of it. Despite good costumes, uh, it also looks steel gray. Like, this shot in Seattle as opposed to Tuscany and all these other great locations you're going to. I was not enthused at all by House Gucci myself as an Italian man. Not really. Well, I haven't seen any of those. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely interested in both of your good picks. I, especially after you saw The Last Duel and you messaged me about it. It really got my interest. And I was really psyched to see it then. Yeah, it wasn't really playing anywhere where I could see it in time due to my work schedule. So I never got the chance. Um, and House of Gucci, you know, we talked about this before. The trailer was fucking stunning. The trailer sold this movie to me like instantly. I'm like, oh, God, I really want to see this. And just all the early reviews coming out and then hearing you talk about it. I'm like, oh, fucking bummer. But, you know, I, it's definitely one of those. I'm still going to see it, but I it's definitely a wait. Yeah, especially, look, for you, who's been so excited to talk about Pacino at some point, he's much better than Driver in this movie. He's another one of the highlights every time he shows up. <laughs> well, that's I guess that's good news. Uh, but, yeah, uh, this is where I leave you. I, I remember the, the seeing the trailer for it. I watched the trailer. And, uh, yeah, it looks fucking like melodramatic garbage to me. It, it just doesn't. I'm good. And uh, I'm, I'm a sucker for Jaramouche, uh, for the most part. Uh, we'll hear about that again in a minute. But I didn't even know about Patterson, so I definitely want to check that one out. Yeah, by the way, shout out Jody Comer is the one who was in The Last Duel, who I didn't mention, who should get nominated for an Oscar for that movie. She's she's so stellar. Oh. And also, Ridley Scott, you know, recently came out, which is like, hey, look, guys, um, the reason The Last Duel didn't do too well is these young millennials, they're looking at their phones, they're not going to go to the movies. So I heard that way before, like when the movie was bombing. Like, I got to see this in the theater. I did not turn on my cell phone at all for The Last Duel. You don't know how tempted I was for the House of Gucci, sir. So tempted to get on my fucking phone and message Adam like, "This movie fucking sucks, lol." I'm like, "I got another hour." <laughs> it's so <Come> bad. <laughs> uh, but anyway, Adam, please. Yeah. What are your choices for the double redo? All right. So for my good picks, uh, you know, I, I'll go pretty brief. We've talked about this movie on the show already. You already mentioned it earlier, but I have Inside the Well and Davis fantastic fantastic film adam driver has a very good part in it but it's incredibly memorable uh just the the line delivery of especially uh his sort of lyric in the song is so fucking funny to me every time outer space like it's just fucking great um and then i have silence the martin scorsese uh period piece is one of those that i don't think a lot of people gave it a chance at all i mean probably the runtime also, it's Martin Scorsese, and it's not a, like a sort of mafioso movie. And, uh, you know, some unfortunately, some people, that's what they want, or like a Wolf of Wall Street type of film. And uh, this one, it's a stunning movie. It is gorgeous. And Adam Driver, but particularly Andrew Garfield, turn into fucking phenomenal performances. It's a really, really solid movie. And it's another one of those passion projects, uh, much like we talked about with Don Quixote, maybe not as sort of problematic but it's one of those definitely passion pieces smart scorsese wanted to get made for a long time and he did and then it sort of came out with a whimper uh but i i definitely think it's worth a watch and for my bad uh i mean i don't think anybody would be surprised that i would put rise of skywalker on this not to say that adam dry was terrible as kylo ren i actually think he's one of the saving graces of the new franchise but this is just dumb and it's definitely one of those movies where it feels like a spider-man th- three at the time even though i finally sort of we rewatched spider-man three and i like it quite a bit more than i did then but this definitely feels like one that was just made to please the internet fandom where we have to not only repair the damage that people think we did with last jedi but now we got to give them all the answers that they've either wanted or that they already sort of guessed and we'll just confirm it for them throughout the whole movie it's just it's a terrible terrible film it looks bad Everybody looks bored in it, including Adam Driver. It's 
easily, I would say, the worst of all the Star Wars films. Uh, and that's including Solo and all those. And then the other one is a Jim Jarmusch movie, which has a incredible cast with Adam Driver and Bill Murray and Tilda Swinton and Iggy Pop and et cetera, et cetera. It's the Dead Don't Die, the sort of zombie comedy that we were all promised from the trailers when we did not get a very funny movie at all. It's a very stale, boring film. I'd argue Tilda Swinton is doing her best in it. Uh, I think she sort of carries it. Adam Driver does have a few funny moments to it. But other than that, it's just a dull, stale affair. Yeah, um, I believe uh, Jessica Scott, past and future guest on the show, put that as her review and she had like a big question mark about it. I still generally agree with that. I think there's a lot of fascinating things that make me not hate that movie, but it is still very like, I don't know, it still doesn't work ultimately. It was a plain movie for me, and I think that was maybe not the best place to see it, but also maybe the opportune best place to see it also. <laughs> if you really think about it, like, oh, I can kind of be engaged, but not as much. Um, Rise of Skywalker is one where we've talked about Star Wars on the show, uh, on the Patreon in particular. Uh, patrons, uh, $1 a month, you can get go in the archives, listen to our commentary on The Last Jedi, which we have slightly differing opinions on, but we both agree we like Adam Driver in those movies. I, I think he's very good in both Force Awakens and Last Jedi. In Rise of Skywalker, he is tasked with so much like, hey, we're going to exposit things to you, Adam Driver. And he's like, uh-huh. Oh, Emperor Palpatine's back? Somehow he returned? Uh-huh. 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 Oh, Ray, I love you so much. I can't emphasize enough spoilers for this fucking movie. At the very ending when Adam Driver looks like he's dead and fucking uh, Daisy Ridley kisses him and then he falls over dead and then he disappears... Both times I saw this in the theater because I bought tickets in advance. I didn't know it was going to be this bad. Both times, people laughed audibly <laughs> when they kissed. <laughs> he fucking fell over. Awful. So bad. Such a disappointing note for anybody. If you liked Last Jedi, if you hated that, any Star Wars fan, I think, would have some amount of disappointment. If you liked it, sure. But I think a lot of people, no matter what side, had a lot of issues with that movie at the very least. Completely agree about Silence. Silence is like the great... Uh, counteraction to Don Quixote because he had been trying to do it for so long and he made it in 2016 and yeah not a lot of people saw it I saw it literally at the last opportune point I could see it at the theater where it was the last showing before it was never showing again in my local theater so I was able to do it in the afternoon on like a Thursday I had off or something <laughs> I was able to do that and I'm glad I did I think it's an interesting movie it's a compelling movie that I have some issues with it's not my favorite Scorsese but it has, I agree, really stellar performances from Adam Driver, Andrew Garfield. Liam Neeson has a very good supporting turn in that movie. When he was in the middle of his, like, I'm an old and taken action dad hero type, um, he pulled a little performance in that movie that I thought was stellar. Also one of the great death scenes for, I won't say which of the named actors we said. One of them has a really upsetting death scene that really is stellar in that movie. Inside the one Davis we've talked about on the show. I really dig it. I love Adam Driver in it. I think he's so gawkish. And that was the first time I probably actually saw him. If not that, then Lincoln the year before. But um, once again, you can see just from his visage and then his voice with the outer space bid, the please Mr. Kennedy, um, between him, Oscar Isaac, and... Uh, Justin Timberlake, such a stellar, like, three-person scene. And also, yeah, that's the main thing I thought of when I first heard the Star Wars cast was, oh, both the guys from Inside the Well and Davis are in the Star Wars movies now. Great. So, yeah, those are our picks. We're going to repeat them one more time here. Adam, uh, first go ahead with yours. Uh, for my good, I had Silence and Inside the Well and Davis. And for my bad, I had Rise of Skywalker and The Dead Don't Die. And then uh, my two good choices were uh, The Last Duel and Patterson. And my two bads were This Is Where I Leave You and House of Gucci. And now uh, we're going to start heading out uh, for the show. But stay tuned for us doing our picking at the very end. We have a lot of fascinating things to say about our next week's topic. So stay tuned for which movies we'll cover. But in the meantime, we want to thank some people like Chris Oliver for the intro and outro music used in our show. Listen more of his music at chrisoliver.bandcamp.com. Thanks to Christian Thorlali for our artwork. Follow him at Night of Water. That's Night with a K underscore of underscore water for more of his great stuff and a link tree where you can find his Instagram and stuff like that. And thanks to our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash DEDBpod, where for just $1 a month, you all get uh, to vote in polls where you pick certain movies or topics we cover, like Adam Driver. Thank you so much, patrons. And also, uh, you get to listen to bonus podcasts we do, like 
right around the time, I think maybe the day before this comes out on Tuesday, you will uh, be able to hear our Telebillion episode where Adam and I cover uh, two TV shows. One hasn't seen the other. Uh, so that involves my recommendation to Adam of How To with John Wilson and The Witcher, which he recommended to me. So uh, we're about to record that literally right after this ends. It's insane. You, it's full transparency, people. It's 11.30 p.m. And we're going to keep going. And we're usually by this point <laughs> almost like done completely with recording. Yes. Uh, Yes, that's true. Um, uh, but then you know, we're—it's the impossible dream. We are the, the podcasting hurts people. <laughs> uh, but including uh, one we'll also do for the Patreon coming out. You know, right before December twenty second, we got a new Matrix movie coming out, Adam. So uh, for December, we're gonna cover uh, the three Matrix films as a podcast. We're gonna announce that one huge podcast we're gonna do with a guest who we'll reveal later. Um, that we're going to talk about all three of those movies right before Matrix Resurrections comes out. Are you excited, Adam, to revisit that great trilogy? No, no oh. not particularly. What you say? What you say? What you say? What? <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, nah, <laughs> not son. <laughs> I don't know. I rewatched the Matrix recently. I'm very excited to record. At least I like the third. first one. Yes. Yeah. And we decided to do that because, like, we would never. I don't think be able to cover the matrix any of the one films in an episode right we've kind of agreed on that mutually no so, yeah, yeah no so the patreon feels like a good place to do that and we'll uh post it up and we'll inform you all about that on our various socials when it's out but um for more of our uh antics uh you can you know you know another way to help us out if you can't support the patreon that's totally cool we get it money's tight um a, you know a way to help us out for all, at least one time purchase to do would be the T Public store. We're on T Public, um, the ESO network store, which there's a link in the description for that. You'll be able to buy a mug or a t shirt or anything else with our logo on it. That gets us, uh, you know, a bit of a kickback uh, when you buy that. So it would help out if they did what, Adam? Buy our merch. <laughs> buy our merch. <laughs> oh, please, Mr. Kennedy buy our merch uh but for more of our antics uh, as a show follow us on twitter and facebook at dedb pod you can also send us feedback double edge double bill at gmail.com all spelled out and uh, for my individual musings you can find me on twitter instagram and letterboxes at not the who's tommy i just do some writing at both mariani thomas dot wordpress.com and uh film dash cred.com and you can find me on twitter or instagram at atom or adam that's a-t-o-m underscore o-r underscore a-d-a-m and i'm also on letterbox at schmanson that's s-c-h-w-a-n-d-t-s-o-n yes and uh for more of the podcast please subscribe to apple podcast spotify stitcher or any other podcasting platform if you're listening on eso why not listen to all the other great shows on there um or dig into our archives on our Podbean main feed for a bunch of shows we even did even before we joined DSO. And nothing else, if you are strapped for cash and you can't buy the merch or support us on the Patreon for the $1, totally cool. It would be helpful, though, for completely free if you were to rate, review, or share the show around on whatever platform gets us more visibility out there in the ether. Yeah, Christian, I've seen what you've been doing, buddy. I've noticed it. I appreciate it. Don't start fucking slipping on it, though. <laughs> and also our last guest, Scott, shared the show, of course. Oh, I don't know. Whatever. He's been on it seven times. True. Very true. Very true. So now, Adam, it's time to do our picking for next week. And every week, Adam and I each, uh, one of us has two good movies. The other one has two bad movies. We assign numbers between one and ten for those choices. And uh, the other person picks number between one and ten. And whatever that gets us closest to will get us most likely our good and our bad feature. However, we do have a rule called the Godfather rule where Adam and I each have a single veto in our back pocket. We have to use until May of next year, our next anniversary. And um, we basically have this veto where if we hear an option, like say Adam has the two bad choices for next week and I hear his first choice, I'm like, hmm, I don't want to cover this movie. You know what? Actually, Adam, I'll take the cannoli is what I'll say. Thus, that choice is eliminated. The veto is gone. But we must go with whatever other choice Adam has. So that's the gamble that we always have with this. And Adam, it's so interesting that Adam Driver got his start amongst many other things with um, a collaboration with Steven Spielberg 
in Lincoln in 2012. And uh, we're doing a Steven Spielberg episode next week. Are you excited? We're finally doing this. We've never done this. Yeah, no, I am. I mean, he's one of the most prolific directors of my lifetime. Uh, you know, he, he's probably on the Mount Rushmore of famous directors in my lifetime. Steven Spielberg is right there. He's the Lincoln. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, obviously we're doing this because uh, West Side Story is coming out, which is a very interesting take on it. Because according to the trailers, it's it's only about Maria, which is very fascinating to me that they're making West Side Story with only the female character. Yes, that's true. He, he's adapting West Side Story, which we should also mention just on a slight, another sad note to end this episode. We're recording this the day they announced Stephen Sondheim died, who wrote the uh, lyrics and stuff for West Side Story. That happened a few hours before we recorded, so RIP Mr. Sondheim, great lyricist and writer. But uh, we're also going to be picking uh, just Steven Spielberg movies for next week. I have the two good ones, and you have the two bad ones. So uh, for my two good choices, please pick a number between one and ten. I will go with number nine. Ooh, musical. Great. We're, we're, we're a cycle for the intro. Um, so we're going to, for that, at number nine, um, it's very close to number eight, where I had a movie I think is probably his last masterpiece, Spielberg. One of the great movies he did in the last, like, you know, in the new millennium, quite frankly. I have... 2002's Catch Me If You Can. That is a great one, and I haven't seen it since it came out. <gasps> so I am not taking the cannoli. I am very excited to revisit that one. Yes, well, at number two, I had a movie that was very celebrated at the time and is still like a movie reference constantly. But I don't think nearly as much as Steven Spielberg's other movies, if you can say like that kind of law of averages. I have Close Encounters of the Third Kind. One of the all-time great sci-fi movies. Uh, I absolutely am in love with that film. That movie uh, probably made me a science fiction fan and also scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. Also, one of the great recent Fathom event screenings I went to when I was uh, several years ago at around the time of Dragon Con, I went with uh, actually previous guests on the show, Tori and Caitlin was there visiting uh, and also Tori's girlfriend and some other people. It was a really fun time. That sounds real nice. Yes, yes. But now, Adam, you have the two bad. I do. Very interesting. So, pick number nine. Um, I'm going to go the opposite end of the scale. I'm going to go with uh, number three. All righty. So, both of mine are sequels to movies he has made previously. I'm pretty sure you can guess where I'm going with this already. (laughs) And number two, I have Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. This movie's been a specter on us. We've, we've nearly picked it a couple times. You know what, Adam? I think it's time we did it, because I don't hate this movie. And I'd like to at least mildly not defend it, but say it's not that bad, guys. I am going to keep this right here. I'm not going to take the cannoli. All right. And at number 10, I have... I, I can't stand it. The Lost World Jurassic Park. I think a worse movie than yeah, Game well, of Skull. Cool. Hot I, take. I, oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Also, there are worse Steven Spielberg movies. We'll probably talk about that next week. Um, but until then, everybody, that is the end of our Adam Driver episode here. Uh, but, you know, we are going to dream the impossible dream and fight the unbeatable foe that is ending this podcast finally. <laughs> it's about fucking time. <laughs> <laughs> has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.